Chapter 16, Capital and Labor. To quote Charles and Mary Beard, 25 years after the death of Abraham Lincoln, America had become in quantity and value of our products, the first manufacturing nation in the world. So wrote this uh, historians expressing the amazement many Americans felt when they considered the remarkable expansion of their industrial economy as the 19th century drew to a close. Abundant raw materials, a large labor supply, the emergence of ruthless entrepreneurs and a federal government only too happy to promote business and expanding market for goods all contribute to the explosion of industry in America. Despite the nation's burgeoning economic strength, the American government in this era was ill-equipped to deal with growing social problems. Governance was easily split uh, between Republicans and Democrats in most elections and divided government prevented any one party from changing the country in any dramatic fashion. Voter turnout in this era was astounding. Almost 80% of eligible voters uh, cast their ballots in general elections. Today, uh, barely half do in, in even big elections. And people remained fiercely loyal to their parties for personal, economic, and religious reasons after the Civil War. Major advances in communication in this era, including the laying of the transatlantic telegraph cable across the ocean floor, connecting Europe and the United States. And that was shortly after the Civil War ended. Alexander Graham Bell developed the first real telephone in the decade afterward, and by 1900, over one million people had access to one. An Italian inventor developed a radio in the 1890s, then the typewriter, cash register, and calculator were created in short order. Electricity became a source of light and power beginning in the 1870s, and cities were relying on the technology for streetlights, railway systems, elevators, and increasingly to power individual homes. Iron production exploded as thousands of miles of railroad track were to be laid after the Civil War. New technologies allowed iron to be converted into steel, and a booming steel industry sprung up in and around Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania due to its abundant uh, iron, but more importantly, its plentiful and easy to access hard and soft coal reserves. So as the steel industry in the United States spread and its furnaces grew hotter, new transportation systems and technologies emerged, including more impressive steam engine technologies. The steel industry grew closer to the railroad industry, and the industry's need for lubrication for its machines helped fuel a totally new industry at the end of the century, the oil industry. Demand for oil and petroleum quickly grew as people realized that it could be used and harnessed as a fuel, An energy industry was born then overnight. The automobile and the airplane followed the development of the oil and gas industry and the invention of the internal combustion engine in Europe. The automobile industry in America developed rapidly. While well, not the first car maker in America, Henry Ford created the motor vehicle industry as we know it, and five million people were driving his cars by 1917. The Wright brothers strapped an internal combustion engine to a glider three years after Henry built his first Ford, and the personal transportation industry was thus born. Engineers and scientists in private industry and in public universities began to drive both basic and practical research where governments had previously led the way. By the turn of the 20th century, uh, many industrialists were embracing principles of scientific management, known sometimes as Taylorism, which advocated for scientific management of human labor in the machine age. Its leading theoretician, Frederick, uh, Frederick Winslow Taylor, persuaded employers all across the world to take control of their workplaces, organizing production, and making workers more interchangeable with less specialization and the moving assembly line was born, rapidly increasing efficiency and trimming consumer costs. The principal agent of industrial development in the late 19th century was still the expansion of railroads. Rail lines gave industrialists access to distant markets and remote sources of raw materials, and they were America's biggest investors. Rail lines approached 200,000 miles by the turn of the century as the industry centralized. In turn, railroad tycoons became symbols of the concentration of American economic wealth and power. After the Civil War, businesses like railroad companies began to sell stocks to the public at large to raise capital, and new corporate forms of organization followed. Businesses grew and brought other businesses through horizontal and vertical integration. So-called robber barons, like J.P. Morgan and Andrew Carnegie, uh, came to control almost two-thirds of the nation's steel production by the 20th century. And they did so by buying up the mines, the mills, and the rail lines themselves. Vertical. 
The most celebrated corporate empire of the late 19th century was actually John D. Rockefeller Standard Oil. Better at him. Rockefeller. He organized horizontally, that is left to right over here, by buying up other refineries across the nation and then expanded vertically by buying the oil barrel factories, the pipelines for the oil, and then the freight cars that trans, uh, transported the oil. Notice the difference, buying up the competition, buying up the entire process of the product itself through every stage of the process, and then thus cutting out competition. He became the symbol of monopoly, but Rockefeller defended himself by pointing to the cutthroat competition of the era as the curse of the modern economy. Later, the creation of the concept of trusts allowed stockholders to entrust a board of trustees with their votes. By the end of the 19th century, 1% of corporations in America controlled one third of all the total nation's manufacturing output. The new rationale for this sort of concentrated capitalism was based on the belief of the individual, an ideology that remains at the heart of American conservatism today. As capitalism roared across America, Farmers, workers, and the middle class increasingly voiced their criticisms, but the tycoons defended their wealth by saying they'd earned their money and power fair and square through their own individual talents, which is largely correct. Their belief in survival of the fittest, also known as social Darwinism, echoed Charles Darwin's scientific theory of evolution. According to this worldview, those who failed were simply unfit for success. But critics of industrial and financial titans claim they had earned their wealth not because of the innate fitness of those who had succeeded, but because they had replaced the natural workings of the marketplace by building great monopolies that would protect them from competition, the vertical and the horizontal integration. Some capitalists found a middle ground by espousing something they called the gospel of wealth. They became philanthropists, think Bill Gates, and treated their private wealth as a public blessing. At the same time, rags to riches stories, notably the works of Horatio Alger, spread a message of social mobility and industrializing America to the poorest and those most down on their luck. Alternative philosophies also existed in this era. Socialism attracted a considerable following in American city centers. Socialists blamed social problems on the wealthy and began to ask government to de-stratify the distribution of land and money and opportunity in the United States. Though most Americans still trusted the nation's capitalist foundations, many grew concerned about the growth of monopoly across these decades in America, specifically the ability of monopolies to control prices by strangling competition in the marketplace. Workers in this economy did experience a real rise in their standard of living, but as labor became de-skilled, think uh, Taylorism, think the assembly line, they traded more predictable lives for often more dangerous, less skilled forms of labor. The industrial workforce ballooned as rural Americans flooded into cities uh, for factory work in this time, and 25 million immigrants hit American shores in the 50 years after the Civil War ended. 25 million immigrants in 50 years. This inflamed uh, ethnic tensions among the working class, as you can imagine, as foreign-born workers commonly uh, took work for lower wages than Native Americans. Um, in mines, factories, and farms from California to Texas, Colorado, and all the way to New England. And by native, of course, I'm not talking about American Indians. I'm, I'm talking about older, the older stock of immigrants who'd come to America who had uh, believed it to be theirs and theirs alone. Wages and working conditions in this era took a serious hit. People used to agrarian or agricultural work found themselves in new impersonal factory settings, and they worked 10 hour days, six days a week. Among families, women and children increasingly joined the labor force to make ends meet in these American cities. Laborers attempted to fight back against poor working conditions by creating national unions, but widespread public opposition to strikes and radical tactics took the steam out of union efforts. Groups like the Knights of Labor and the American Federation of, uh, American Federation of Labor hoped to do things like abolish child labor, standardize an eight hour workday give workers more control over their workplaces. But conflicts between laborers and employers often turn bloody during this era. With a Haymar uh, Haymarket Square bombing in Chicago coming to symbolize the American public's distrust of organized labor and its more radical fringes. Strike breakers and police were often employed by companies to end worker demonstrations at the barrel of a gun, literally um, you know, hired specifically to force people to go back to work. Anarchism, previously not a term associated with violence, became a code word for terrorism 
in American minds. And labor forever struggled and continues to struggle to gain a foothold against big, uh, big business uh, in America. No view, uh, no group, excuse me, uh, viewed the economic imbalances at the end of the 19th century with greater frustration than America's farmers, who turned their anger into action by organizing a vast political movement to reshape the nation's laws. Farmers had been organizing to teach each other scientific methods of raising crops and animals uh, in this era, but economic hardships and what they perceived to be federal indif uh, indifference toward big business concentration turned their organizations political. Farmers' organizations in the North and South successfully challenged local and state laws beginning in the 1870s, but they knew they would need to make their reforms, uh, uh, take their reforms to the national level to challenge interest rate business. Think of the railroads and think of how no uh, one corporation is going to be centered in any one state. What they wanted to uh, attempt to change was actually federal law. In places like Florida, Cincinnati, St. Louis, Omaha, farmers met to proclaim the creation of a new party to approve a new set of principles and to nominate a candidate for the American presidency. They called themselves populists, and they were members of the People's Party. And they sought to gain support for their Omaha platform, uh, hashed out in Nebraska. Despite efforts to attract labor support, the movement re remained largely agrarian, as mostly farmers and rural people. And disagreement about incorporating blacks in the movement further prevented the party from challenging the Democrats and the Republicans. Ideologically, populists called for a graduated income tax, the abolition of national banks, and the end of absentee ownership of land, the direct election of senators, and government-owned warehouses where they could safely store their crops. Most importantly, they rejected the laissez-faire orthodoxies of their time and raised the most powerful challenge to industrial capitalism America has ever known. Uh, they will be unsuccessful, which we'll get to in just a minute, but they will certainly inspire the progressives just a generation later. The Panic of 1893 launched the most severe depression the nation had yet seen. It started with the failure of two railroads, uh, and if you play Monopoly, uh, it's the Philadelphia and the Reading Railroads. Um, they'd failed to make payments on, on loans that were due. Two months later, other businesses were failing, and a stock market collapse sunk many of the national banks, which caused co uh, contraction in the market, forcing many small loan-dependent businesses to also shut their doors. This national depression reflected the degree to which all parts of the American economy were finally now connected. It also showed how dependent Americans had become on the biggest railroad, corporate, and financial institutions. 22% of workers in this era uh, lost their jobs in the Depression, and efforts to organize marches of the unemployed on Washington went ignored by Congress. To many Americans, their fallout, the fallout from the Depression, the Homestead and Pullman strikes, for example, was a sign that dangerous instability and maybe even a revolution was afoot in the United States. Labor radicalism, real and exaggerated, heightened the sense of crisis at the end of the 19th century. Financially, something called the money question became a major issue in American politics after the Depression. The debate centered on what should be the basis of the U.S. dollar and what would give it value. Our dollars today rest on nothing more than public confidence in the government. They are fiat currency. But in the 19th century, people believed that currency was worthless if there was nothing concrete backing it up, if it was not actually a promise to pay something, generally gold or silver. Gold and silver had traditionally backed up the dollar at a ratio of 1 to 16, uh, but Congress ditched silver in 1873, which few noticed, so you can only redeem it uh, for gold at a lower ratio. As silver prices plummeted and money dried up after the Depression, farmers suspected a, cons uh, con a big conspiracy between big banks and Congress to devalue the currency and lower the prices of crops, and they demanded government action. What farmers wanted then and what farmers generally want today is inflation uh, to inflate, uh, so uh, higher prices for their goods, and then the existing debts that they have would thus be cheaper as a consequence. So if the currency is being inflated, what's, uh, uh, they get a better price today and the debt is smaller tomorrow. The Democratic Party, long blamed for the economic depression, fell to pieces in 1896. Ultimately, they nominated the free silver firebrand candidate, William Jennings Bryan, as their party candidate in the 1896 presidential election. Free silver, meaning he wanted to back the dollar again with silver, um, increase inflation across the country. His cross of gold speech rallied the anti-business movement in America, pulling populists into the party and scaring the wits out of Republicans, uh, generally American businessmen and conservatives. Basically, he suggested that the lower classes had a crown of thorns, a gold crown of thorns being pressed against their head um, by the wealthy, powerful, and elite. Brian stumped all across the country and spoke to some 5 million Americans during the campaign season. Though he lost that election, 
and the People's Party began to dissolve under its own weight. Um, Brian's impact on American politics was not yet finished. He'll come back up in future chapters and the movement he sort of began with rural farmers or he represents with rural farmers will come back full force this time from America's